to you here at the Corning Museum of Glass in our live stream this afternoon. We have a very special guest artist, Christina Logan, here with the Corning Museum of Glass team. I'll introduce Christina there right in the middle, so we'll be watching her most of this afternoon. And then we have uh, Jeff Mack as our gaffer, Dane Jack, Catherine Ayers, and myself, Josh. So, but yeah, Christina comes to us from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. She's a world glass maker. Uh, she's known as the, the dot queen, and she's recognized for her, her precisely patterned delicate glass beads and intricate objects and jewelry throughout the world. I am. All right. So today we're going to make a few different vessels. Uh, Christina can talk about a little bit about the process when she has here in just a moment. And anybody online that has any questions, uh, just direct them to our... Our, our, our team here, we can answer them uh, as quickly as we can for you. All right, so Christina has been working the past few days here making some parts. So we've got a few um, delicate bead parts that she's worked on. We're going to attach this to a punty. So Dane's going to start to make a punty. And she's going to attach that right to that. So after it's attached to that, she clips that, and there we go. A nice round of applause. All right, so we're going to start to assemble these pieces together. This is a collaborative work here. So while she keep, continues to work on that, Dane and Jeff are going to work on assembling some parts to that, and eventually a stem and a foot and a cup. Now the glass that we're using is a soda lime glass, silica sand, soda ash, and limestone. We're doing a little different technique here. We're using um, a 50-50 uh, percentage of Moretti and uh, soda lime glass. Moretti is made by a Fetre and Murano. And we're working with different types of glass. We have to keep that compatibility, that coefficient of expansion, the same number. So Catherine's going to gather some of that 50-50 mix out of our little melter here. And meanwhile, Dane's actually started to prepare the foot for this. So we spool it on there. Jeff will center, cool, and shape it. Catherine will bring over a little bit more, and we'll do a, a second part of that. Uh, and when Jeff pulls that away, we call it a cast-off. When the glass is hot enough like that, we can pull it quickly away from itself, casting the material away. Now, when making glass, there's lots of teamwork. You rarely do this by yourself. is making that a volio for the foot to be attached to. So Christina's work is all over the globe in the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, Renwick Gallery, the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, Massachusetts, here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Here we go, Dane's bringing over that blown foot. We inflate it a little bit, we clip that, and now we've got a closed bubble, which we need to open that. <laughs> now occasionally we have to reheat everything, making sure things don't get too cold or crack due to thermal shock. So occasionally you'll see uh, some glass makers slide the entire piece of glass into the furnace, heating everything for a few seconds. 
but really focusing the heat just on the portion we want to continue to shape or tool. Now a little light tap, that should break free. And we have an opening. Now that that bubble is open, we can start to shape that into a nice foot. Now during this demonstration, we're gonna make a few parts. We'll park those parts into our garage, which is another piece of equipment. We can keep things warm and continue to work on other sections or parts to this. Now, as the glass cools very quickly, we have to reheat it to continue shaping. So Jeff goes right back to the reheating chamber, sitting at a nice 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we're working very delicate like this. Every time we set down the pipe or punty, be very gentle. We don't want anything to fall right off onto the floor if we set it down too hard. Any vibration can send that right to the floor. So Catherine will step in and give a little paddle there to the bottom and keep that flat and flush. And Dane's going to get ready to load this stem and this foot into our garage. So we've got a little fork there, a light tap, pops right off. And away we'll go to the garage for a uh, remainder of the time for a little bit. I'll explain a little bit of my technique. Right now what I'm doing is I'm balling up the glass. Traditionally I'm a glass bead maker, so all of the work that I do in my own studio, I work on a stainless steel mandrel and build the glass around it. But here, in the studio today, I am working with a solid uh, form of glass and then decorating it like I decorate my beads But there's no hole in it. So sometimes I'll call it a bead even though it's not a bead And this idea of working with Jeff and making goblets came about last year when we were working and teaching here at Corning over at the studio and Jeff was teaching a goblet class and I was teaching a glass bead making class. And then uh, one evening we decided to put the, the two ideas together and try to make a goblet. So he made two goblets, one that he took home and one that I took home. And then uh, a year later, being now, um, we've decided to try this collaboration in a more real way um, to take the, the three days of time it would take to do some real experimentation and collaboration to try to come up with some um, ideas that, uh, that would really work. So the challenge for me back at home was to try to figure out, okay, you know, our, our first attempt, I actually did use a bead that had a hole in it, but pulling it out of the kiln, um, it had a big risk of cracking. So I decided to work solid instead to eliminate that. It comes with its own little set of challenges. Um, but I came here to Corning with a toolbox full of finished pieces, finished uh, beads, that we've been putting them into goblets ever since. My bead making here for one of them takes a good hour. 
um, to create one of these shapes. And the goblet making is a little bit faster than that, so I've been a little bit behind um, in working as quickly as I can to keep up. Christina, uh, so what's the longest bead you've ever worked on? Oh, I've worked on a bead for about three hours. Wow. Yeah. So Jeff has uh, made the top portion of this cup. And uh, we've got a jack line into it. That's that line near the blowpipe. That's how we can get that bubble free off the blowpipe. Catherine's going to make our punty again. And again, a punty is just a temporary connection or handle to hold on to the vessel or object as we break it free from the blowpipe. This step's all about timing, temperature, and teamwork, though. You know, just the right temperature so it sticks just a little bit, but also not too hot so it doesn't fuse together. So after we stick it on, we center the two. In a moment, a light tap. There it is. That's where a lot of beginners tend to struggle is that step right there. They tap it just a little too hard, and you end up with a floor model. Now we'll develop some more heat back into the material so we can start to open the top of the form. Now we're using this uh, homemade cobalt blue we melted right here in-house. To make a nice cobalt blue, you have cobalt oxide. Different metal oxides make different colors for us. Green, you got iron oxide, cobalt blue, cobalt oxide, copper makes a nice light blue. Purple, you got manganese. And the most expensive color is a pink. Pink is made with gold chloride. So tools a little bit makes another jack line and in a light tap, this should shear right off. So when you're a good glass blower, you have to be an excellent glass breaker. What that step did there is we t uh, thinned out the material. Sometimes we want to take away excess material from the break-off point from the jack line. And that glass can sometimes be a little thicker towards the top. How are you doing, folks? Come on in. So welcome. This is uh, Christina Logan here. She's our guest artist. And welcome to our live stream. We're on live TV on the internet. So today we're making a few uh, uh, complicated forms here. Christina is working on these, these techniques using a bead technique of dotting and patterning the material. And she's making the intricate middle portions. And meanwhile, the rest of the team here, we're going to start to conjoin those two together. This tool is called a sofietta. It's a blowing tool. You can plug the opening and expand the top of the form. You guys have any questions right now at all? If you have any questions, just find my attention. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this is homemade cobalt blue we made right here in-house. So every color in glass is made with different metal oxides. So in cobalt blue, we add cobalt oxide. It makes a nice cobalt blue. You add copper, you got a light blue. You add rust or iron oxide, you got a nice green. So lots of different metals make different colors. Now, uh, the most expensive color I just touched on a little bit ago is pink. Pink is made with gold chloride. So very expensive compared to a green iron oxide rust. The nice thing about rust is you can go to the parking lot and scrape someone's vehicle, and you can make a nice green glass. Can't really do that with gold. I don't think we have gold cars out there. So we've got the cup portion finished here. Uh, Jeff just signaled to Catherine to start the inside punty. And meanwhile, Dane has picked up the, the foot and the stem over there, and he's going to get that ready to go.
All right, so this is called a, a dirty punty, or it's got a little bit of resist. So we cut off some portion of it, we roll it on the floor to create like a little bit of resist, and we punty the inside of the object. And as soon as it's on center, we'll break it free from the original punty. Now we're essentially backwards or upside down. Yeah. So Catherine's going to start to create our avolio portion in between the two. It's a nice transition piece. We're using, again, a 50-50 mix of a fetre and soda lime glass. It's actually Moretti from a fetre. Now, most of the glass we use is a soda lime glass a coefficient of a 96. But this mixture, we need to kind of uh, compensate for um, some compatibility issues. So we've mixed the two together in a small tank right here, and that's what we're bringing to the, the vessel right now. And this has been an experimental process over the years, so Jeff and Christina have worked together a couple of years now together doing this technique. For the first time, I had some struggle issues a little bit, but they figured it out, and now they're experts at this technique. So there we are. We've got the two joined together. That little tap is all it takes for that to shear free from the punty. We're just about ready to put this first cup away. And all glass that we make has to be cooled properly or annealed. So we're going to put this into our annealing oven, where it will come down to room temperature nice and slow. So some finer adjustments, and then a light tap again. That dirty punty, the inside punty, should pop nice and clean away. And Dane will put it into our annealing oven. So you a nice 905 degrees Fahrenheit. If we don't cool that properly or anneal it, that would break in about 15 pieces in about 10 minutes if we don't anneal it. Okay. So we're gonna get started here in just a moment on the second piece. We're going to try this triple stack piece, I believe, here next. So I'm going to take the bead that I'm working on now. Of course, it's not a bead. There's no hole, but I'll call it that. Um, I'm going to take this, and typically, when I'm in my home studio, I'll work on it start to finish. And I won't stop, and I won't put it away in a kiln um, in between on the process. But here, um, I have been. Um, putting them away, you know, working with Jeff and the team on the goblets and then um, taking them back out and continue to work on them. So this one I'm going to make sure that it's warm enough. I'm going to transfer it, put it into the kiln. The kiln is at 950 degrees. So I'm going to make that move. And now we're going to make the plan on the next goblet that we're going to make which will have three beads attached to it. We'll call it the triple. And um, that design originally came from um, me seeing in the uh, collection here at the museum, uh, the Nuremberg goblets from the 1700s. So we're just going to organize and <laughs> figure out um, which ones we're starting with, top, middle, or bottom. So someone earlier was asking online uh, about the coefficients of the type of glass we're using. So this, this Moretti Fetre is a COE of 104. And then our glass here in-house is a 96 COE. So 
If we add 50% of each, we can create a little composition of both that would work well together. And that's what's in this small mini melter here is a 50-50 percentage. And a Fetre is a Murano glass. So it's a COE of 104 coefficient of expansion. Some people always ask, can we just use any type of glass? It is Italian, yep. Um, you know, we always have to be cautious of the number of the coefficient of expansion. So generally, we always use soda lime glass typically here in the States, which is one of the most common type of glasses out there in today's age. That's what your light bulbs are made of, your pickle jars are made out of. All right, so here we go. In the second piece, we're going to start to assemble this. So Jeff has a punty. And Christina is attaching. Nice one. Right to the punty. So part of the excitement for me is that transfer. You know, not only getting the end result to look good, but just physically how to transfer work from the flame to the furnace. And um, that has been a really fun challenge. So right now, I'm trying to give them the beads in um, the position that they want, whether or not I am attached to the top of the bead or the bottom of the bead so that they can then take them and then um, put them together at the furnace. And Christina, your glass over there you're holding onto is essentially your blowpipe or punty. It right? is. So it's not really a, um, you know, I'm not using beautiful punties that, that um, break off when I tap them. These are glued on handles, let's call it, um, and I'm just attaching them. They're really uh, tentative, so I have to kind of be careful because this kind of glass is really sensitive to um, heat shock. All right, so number two. So this will be the middle of the triple goblet, and then I just cut it off, and then Dane takes it away. And then I'm going to make sure that he's ready for the third one. So Dan's going to give me a two-minute warning. He's going to attach those two together first and then let me know, and I'll get the other one ready. So I'm not going to take out the bead that I'm working on because I'd have to put it right back again, so I'm just going to wait. Once those are attached, then I'll take out the bead that I was decorating and continue with that. It's all really timing, right? All timing. It is all about timing. <laughs> and what's interesting for me also coming here, um, you know, being a flame worker, I'm home, I'm working alone, with my torch and nobody around me. And really at the furnace, it's a communication among people in order to get a piece done. So this has been really a nice change to communicate with other people about it. It's like a dance. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So we're centering the two uh, portions for right now. Catherine's gonna start our avolio, again out of our mixture. Ready and soda lime. We spool it on and casting it away just like that. Now the delicate transfer, pass off the punties to each other here. And we'll do the same thing. So I just got word that ready to go for the last one. So I'll come over here to the kiln, open that up, take it out. I have to be pretty quick about getting it from the kiln to the torch because like I said, the, um, this glass is really sensitive to change in temperatures. So when we first did our first experiment, we heated up a bead and we put it into what is called a garage in, in the hot shop to heat it up and then we picked it up directly onto a punty pipe. And um, there was a great chance for the uh, beads to crack. And we've reduced that by going from the kiln directly into the torch and then waiting and then attaching it to the punty pipe. So that was kind of a nice um, success decision. So looks like Dane's preparing the, the last punty for the third part of the stack of our stem here. 
Meanwhile, Jeff's is maintaining an even temperature on those two. And now I'll just snap this off, and then Dane will take it away. You're welcome. And while they build up those three and work on that goblet, then I'm going to go back and then pick up the piece that I was working on in the kiln. It's partially decorated and then continue to decorate it. So one thing I have to be careful is when I take it out of the kiln like that, a lot of this glass rod is hot. Yeah, when Christina takes that out of that kiln, that kiln's sitting at a really high temperature, so that, that, that glass handle that she's holding onto can be very, very hot. So she's got to be careful. And also we want to be careful of inducing it into the flame too quickly. We don't want it to crack or shock. on the third. And then we'll join the three together. Attachment number three, right in the bullseye there. We hit the ovolio with the jacks for a second, and then a light tap here in just a moment. Everything will break free. How are you guys doing? Any more, qu any more questions right now? Well, the one we'll put away will have a sharp edge in the inside a little bit. Yeah, it's a small connection, so it's maybe the size of maybe less than a dime, pretty small. Um, but anything that's really big, like some of these things, sometimes we can have to grind them. Um, but these delicate things, we can kind of get away with that. Again, another Evolio. Again, timing, so Jeff said go heat that quickly while he lets his cool down. And Catherine brings it right over, same thing. Attach, coil, and cast it off. Meanwhile, Dane's got prepared over there our blown foot for the bottom portion of this. Do that second part of the volio. One of the questions somebody asked was the process of my dot work. Um, all of my designs really come from a very simple design element, which is a dot. So I have students who come to me who ask me, you know, how to improve their precision and their patterning and their flame control and their dot control. And I really enjoy going over details. I think that the details in my work 
You know, that's something that I love, and I love teaching details. What I can say is that I work with a really soft flame so that I don't work very fast. And I try to heat up just the amount of glass that I need to do the job. And so every single time that I touch down my glass rod that's in my hand, my right hand in this case, every time I touch that rod down to the surface of my bead, it has to be the same temperature. So if, for instance, it got hotter and hotter, my dot would get larger and larger. And then if my glass was cold, my dot would be small. So I really have to pay attention. Now, because I've been making, working in glass for almost 30 years, I can kind of go ahead and put these dots down all at, all at once. And it almost looks like I get a little rhythm going. It's not really about the rhythm. It's more about feeling the heat control in the glass. And if you don't have in the beginning that kind of heat control, then you just have to work slowly. So maybe heating up the glass and putting one dot down and then waiting and then reheating and putting another dot down instead of going one after another after another. Now, Christina, when you're melting those colors and you have to be cautious and not burning the color, right? I do have to be careful about not burning the color. Um, this kind of glass really doesn't burn away. Um, some of the yellows uh, will, but it's more what I'm trying to pay attention to is I'm trying to heat this in such a way that all of the pattern melts at the same time. So I don't want to melt any one side faster than another side or else the design will slip and slide over the surface. So it's a really slow bake. And then as far as the design goes, you know, over the years of doing this, it's, uh, you know, how much pattern can I fit over a small space? It's kind of hard to tell, but we've actually got a folded lip on that foot as well. And a little bit of light um, compressed air can cool certain areas of that down. So when he's reheating this, he's running the risk of everything getting too hot. So that's why the compressed air can cool specific zones or regions down. So keeps things a little more stable. So one advantage of working solid here that I find um, that I don't really have with the bead making is that I can change um, punties over to the other side. And they're, in, they're virtually handles. So I can switch the bead over and then work on the other side um, so I can get the decoration really tight to the ends of these shapes. So there's that transfer. That torch you saw Jeff using is our fluffy torch, just a propane flame. It's a little bit of colder flame than a, a hot torch, but it can just kind of keep things a little bit warm as well. So Dane's got the fork preheated. A light tap should pop right off, and away that will go to the garage for a little bit. So again, the genesis of this idea um, of a goblet with these, in essence, beads on it came from um, the Nuremberg goblets from the 1700s. When I first saw those in the museum's collection, um, I was completely excited thinking that, oh, those you know, glass balls look like beads to me and I want to make a goblet like that with a lid. And so it took me about 10 years and I ended up making them, but by combining materials like um, bronze and cast glass and pot de verre cups and attaching everything, I really like mixing materials. And I made my version of the Nuremberg goblets. 
and then uh, it's kind of coming full circle to make them now um, completely in glass without any other metal components with the flame working and the furnace working. I guess I can't call them Nuremberg goblets anymore because they're not made in Nuremberg. So we had a question come through online about uh, how the punty stays attached to the, that bead without um, heating that joint up too quickly. It's really a, on skill and expertise and experience. Uh, if we overheat that connection to that punty to the bead, it would fuse on there. So it's a real light connection and then any light vibration or tap, that can make it pop right off really clean. But if we go on too hot or overheat that area, we run the risk of breaking part of the bead off. Um, this connection actually is a little bit stronger than that. It's not completely like uh, a punty connection. So if I were to tap on this, it would probably stay put. I have it not lightly attached. I have it really glued on there. But um, because this um, FHA glass is so heat sensitive, my big issue is the heat in the bead or the glass ball and then how it transfers to the cold piece of glass. So oftentimes they'll be cracking there. And um, if I don't keep it warm, and if there is a little bit of a crack, then I'll just transfer it over to the other side and then um, start fresh. So I would say that that's the technically one of the tricky parts to deal with. All right, so we're just about ready to transfer this top portion of our goblet for the triple stack. So Catherine's going to start to prepare the punty again. Again, a punty is just a temporary handle or connection to hold on to everything. So we're going to connect that right to that bubble, break everything free from the blowpipe. So welcome, guys. Come on in. So this is our live stream demonstration. Christina Logan is our guest artist. So you're on the internet. <laughs> Light tap that breaks free. Now we've got an opening. Now I'll center and then back to the reheating chamber so we can continue to open that and shape it. If you guys have any questions throughout the process, just find my attention. So sometimes when I'm um, uh, wanting to get a like a transparent overlay to make these dots look like they're sort of glowing from within. Instead of putting a transparent over the whole entire piece, I'll put transparent dots over opaque dots. And as they melt in, it makes the whole piece look like it's covered in a transparent. So it's kind of like a, a tricky way of um, getting the job done by, again, just putting dots on dots on dots. The color that I just used, <coughs> is a striking orange. So it goes down and it looks like it's a very light, transparent yellow, but that as it heats up in the flame, it will look like a deeper orange. A light tap just like that. All that excess material shears right off. And again, the reason we do that often is to thin the walls out a little bit. Sometimes the top of the cup form or any vessel can be a little thicker while we're connected to the blowpipe. So trimming or taking away some material can just even the walls out. So I'm going to make a transfer now. <clears throat> and my transfer is just because I want to heat up the side of this bead that is close to uh, my left hand where those dots are still raised, and I can't heat it up enough without melting my handle. So I'm going to switch the handle over to the other side, and then I can heat up that end nicely. Mm. 
And I'll put a couple more layers of color. Christina, what's your favorite color to use? <laughs> uh, my favorite color has changed over time. <laughs> Lately, it has been orangey pink. Orangey pink. Uh, which is kind of funny because I've chose um, to work with a lot of ivories and blues in these pieces, um, which I also love. But uh, I think lately it's been orange and pink and red. Nice. Yeah. They're a little bit tricky to show in demonstrations because those colors often just look either black or red when they're hot. So we're just about ready to do another transfer of this cup form. Again, the inside punty. Catherine pulls some of that material off the pipe. Jeff will cut that. And Catherine will roll on the floor, again, getting some resist. Again, we call that sometimes a dirty punty. It's got a little bit of dirt. And that will hopefully make that pop off really easily later or finished. So Catherine's bringing over the avolio, that mixture again, Moretti and soda lime. And in a moment, a light tap. There it is. We say a nice round of applause. Mm -hmm. So now we've got a few seconds here to adjust and make sure things on center, get the heat even around the, the piece. We'll work together to make sure the foot is stable and on center and also flat so it can s sit on a, on a surface. And you see Jeff push that all the way in the reheating chamber, making sure everything stays warm. Really see that foot nice and hot this time. And wherever it's darker is the colder area. Wherever it's brighter, or more glowing orange is the hotter area. But just training your eye to read and react to that glow. That's just years and years and years of practice. Some final adjustments there. 
Dane's standing by with a loading fork to put this into our annealing oven. So here we go, a light little tap. That's all about that inside punty pops up really clean and easy. And away it goes to the annealing oven. And I think that deserves another round of applause. Okay. So I think we're going to start to make a finial or a lid for this one. So just like this one we made a few days ago, we'll make a top. We're just going to take a couple of caliper measurements of a, of, a, of a goblet we made a few days ago, very similar to the one we just put away. If you take some caliper measurements, you can, you can size things out really nicely. So again, we want a lid or a finial to sit on top of this. So I'm going to be finishing up this. Now, my big decision is whether or not I'm going to put any ivory glass over the surface. I think I'm going to leave this one um, just with these transparents and not put the ivory on it. But I want to put a bunch of really detailed little blue dots of color. So in order to do that, along this outside edge, I'm going to do that first and then I'm going to make the transfer and then work on the other side um, next. So all the years that I've been working, I, I don't use um, thin rods of glass that are called stringers that are um, sort of the size of pieces of pasta. I like to use these thick rods. And um, the reason why is because when I have a hot piece of glass that's glowing, I can get really close to it and not have that thin rod break off and melt in front of me. So um, A little more control, right? I have lots more control, yeah. that's right. Especially when you're working with something that's big and you want to put detail on it. So you can see Jeff and Catherine working on the next step. Inflating that bubble. And we'll ultimately size this to make our, our finial or our lid. But often you'll always see a glassmaker's team uh, in helping inflate the glass. If we hang the pipe and blow ourselves, sometimes we can do that, but sometimes you can't see what's happening to the glass or see how it's expanding. So. If you're sitting level, you can watch the expansion and watch the, how it's reacting to the inflation. So I'm going to go ahead and put the handle on the other side. Oh, really? So we're going to scrap that last bubble. There was a little bit of some black inside that. We're gonna make a really good connection here. It's not really a punty connection, it's just a glued on handle. It's really juicy and hot and moves around, so I have to wait a minute before I can switch my hands over. I'm switching it over to the other side. And now I can work the details on the other side of this piece. I think typically I would use smaller, shorter handles, let's say. Um, but I use these really long ones in case I need to put the piece into the kiln and then take it back out again.
We had a, qu a question come in online about the punty scar. Uh, I think you guys asked that same question earlier about that scar inside there. Will that remain sharp or will it be fire polished? Well, it is going to remain sharp since we're putting the cups away and right away into the annealing oven. Um, sometimes you can, as you're taking it off, hit it with a torch and spot heat that punty scar. Um, but you run the risk of that hot torch hitting that glass really quickly and it could shock it and break it. So we don't want to run the risk of all the time that we put into these pieces, all these decorative details. We don't want that to potentially crack because of that. I find that that scar, um, especially with this team, they're so good at these goblets, is really very minimal at the bottom of the cup. Okay, so one of the questions online, I love questions, keep them coming, is how do I get such fine detail with the rods that I'm using? Um, the fine detail, I would say if somebody is doing this at home and they're, um, you know, a flame worker, bead banker, my number one advice would be to turn down your torch and work as cold as possible in order to get the job done. Um, when you are working cold, you, of course, risk the chance of cracking things, but you also can gain control over your details. So I'm barely, barely using the heat, and then I can just get a little spot of this glass to come off, and like right here, attach to the surface of the bead in just minute amounts. I will, um, it's really hard to explain this without having somebody here in person, but those of you who are out there that have been my students or have heard me lecture, I also talk about um, the inhale and the exhale and using an exhale when you're doing the finest detail work. So I don't mean that you're blowing out um, your nose or your mouth on a big fat exhale. What I mean is that you're controlling your breath when you're moving your hands, and it can really eliminate shaking in your hands and little tremors. Okay, so when I'm spinning this, this is, um, you know, there is no mandrel in my hand. I'm just holding the glass rod, but I am rolling in two directions. I don't roll in one direction. I roll back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And the reason why I do that is so that the object in front of me, we'll call it a bead, is getting heat from both directions. If I only spun it one way, then the dots would sway towards the heat and they would distort. So I roll it in two directions. When I'm putting dots on, I'm always putting dots on and then rolling the dot towards me. So a dot and then rolling it towards me and a dot and rolling it towards me. Okay, so Dane just told me that he is ready for the next bead for the lid of this goblet. So I'm just gonna heat this up a little bit and put it away. And then I'm going to come back, put a couple more dots on, and we're very close to finishing this big bead. So I'm going to just make sure that it's not too hot because I don't want to pick up anything from the um, inside of the kiln. The kiln has a little shelf, so I'm going to let this rest on the shelf so it's sort of suspended in midair. I have a nice long handle, so I'm going to move towards the kiln. So we had another question come in from online is, uh, can you fire polish that punty mark uh, after the fact? But generally, we'd always do it when it's hot, but when it's cooling down or already in the kiln or, or annealer, we're not going to take it back out of the annealer to fire polish. We run the risk of it cracking. And when it comes down to room temperature, we don't want to pick it back up and heat it back up to fire polish that. So.
One of the questions was whether or not I have homemade tools um, in my uh, studio when I work at home. Um, I don't know if I would say homemade tools. Let's say if you are looking across the surface, let's see, the one that I'm holding in my hand right now, this little tool right here is um, from a ceramic supply place. I have another very inexpensive paring knife that is one of my favorite little tools. This one cost me about a dollar. And then I have these um, tiny little paddles, these little graphite paddles that I can use to shape the glass. Even if I'm using a making a large bead, I love to use tiny paddles because it makes me feel like I'm closer to the work. I love tools. I love collecting them, but I really don't use that many um, when I'm working. Just a couple simple, simple tools to get the job done. So right now what I'm doing is this is going to be the top finial of the cup. And I've already done all the decoration. You can kind of see it really well right now in all those little dots. And I'm just keeping it warm, um, waiting my turn for when Jeff and Dane need it for the lid top. And then the top is going to be where my tweezers are out here. So that's where I'm going to give it to him first, and then he's going to attach it to the bottom. What's been really great about um, this experience over three days is, you know, we've never made these before together other than just, um, you know, two experiments a year ago. And um, it's been really rewarding trying to figure it out, um, what works best, and then opening up the kiln every day and um, sort of discussing what looks best. Um, I think that from this experience, it's really given me a lot of um, excitement to pursue making goblets um, in the future. So we're going to attach that punty again to our our bubble to make it our finial or lid. A finial is just a term we use for a lid. And I think something went wrong on the first one, so we scrapped it. Sometimes if you're uh, struggling through something like that, it's easier just to scrap it, start completely over, start from scratch. So sometimes it's a bit of a waiting game. Um, and if you just have the, the patience and then the understanding of the heat, you can really, I could sit here all day long and keep this warm without distorting the pattern. It's just, um, it's nice to have that, that feeling that you can just sit here and um, not worry about destroying the, the work that you spent time on. I have plenty of time. Especially like when you put three hours into, into one piece, right? Exactly. So if you put three hours into a piece, you just have to really give up the, the sense of um, panic <laughs> and time. You just have to just give into it. Yep. I'd rather have something come out just right than have something come out really fast. And you have a nice view inside our reheating chamber 
and that's possibly because of just a regular camera sitting outside the machine, but it's looking through a very special window on the back of the reheating chamber called fused silica, which was developed right here in Corning in 1934. So with this finial, or this top, or this lid that we're trying to, cr trying to create, we're trying to create this uh, exterior fold. It's kind of brim. Uh, we'll sit right on top of the cup. But yeah, fused silica, developed right here in Corning, New York, 1934. It's actually used for fiber optics nowadays. It has really high melting temperatures. So that's what's protecting that camera inside the reheating chamber. So Jeff starts to push down from the inside. You can see that brim or that exterior fold starting to come to life. What he's trying to do is, again, take that, that folded exterior fold and make it touch, make it stick. So third time's a charm. But yeah, it's nice having uh, you close by here. You don't have to uh, literally walk very far to hand uh, something uh, off or transfer totally something. It's been totally great. It's been totally great. It's nice that we can bring the yoke right to the bench to you and set right. that pipe right on that yoke. And Jeff just took a gather out of our cobalt blue tank. And again, we just add cobalt oxide to make a nice cobalt blue. Yep, this whole furnace on the side of the shop, it's just pretty small uh, pot in there. It's about 80 pounds or so. So we can't really melt big quantities of color. So most of the time when we do want to use color, we usually buy it. There's companies uh, that have been doing it for hundreds of years. One of the companies we work with is Reichenbach out in Germany. They've been melting color for a couple hundred years. And it's just like following a recipe. If you add too much metal oxide, you're still going to make a glass, but it's going to make a different coefficient of expansion glass. So I always want to make sure that's just right. <laughs> so I think that... Um what I'm going to do is just take a minute. This, this one is so small. So when these pieces are smaller, they're easier to take in and out of the kiln than when they're large. So I'm going to take this little bead, which is going to be a finial to the lid cup, and I'm going to put it into the kiln and let it sit and wait. It'll be easy to take out. And then I'm going to take out the one that I was just working on, and bring it back into the flame. The first thing I do is put it right into the flame. Mm -hmm. 
No, so the other one actually had some more fragments of uh, iron in them. So some of the, the heads of the pipe are flaking off a little bit. So when we see that, we want to just stop immediately, s scrap it, and start again. We don't want any contaminants in the glass also. We run the risk of a contaminant either cracking it and also just uh, we want everything to be really nice and pretty. So. first couple that we actually broke on the floor, there was nothing wrong with them. They just, the, the, the heat wasn't pushing the glass the way we wanted to. And sometimes it's, again, it's easier to start over versus trying to fix it. Sometimes it's a flat tire, you just put a new tire on the car and go, you know. I'll do the same thing when I'm putting on dots on my very first, let's say, base bead, the gather. If I don't get that spacing down in that first, very first row, Instead of struggling with taking a dot off or, you know, repositioning them, I'll just throw the whole piece away. It's just not worth, you know, that half an hour um, of struggling with it than starting again. Or changing the form, too. Exactly. Yeah, this beautiful, clean form. Exactly. And you don't want to alter the form. Yep. So just tossing it out is totally fine. So unfortunately for glass making, there is a little bit of scrap and garbage. That's just all part of the process. When I first started um, working in glass, I wanted to save all my <laughs> scrap, <laughs> every little bit of it. I had jars of it. I think I still have jars somewhere yeah. in like storage. Then you realize, I can't really do anything yeah. with that. You throw it away. So again, starting the punty transfer step again. Catherine's cooling the material on that marver, which is the metal table we call. So she's marvering the glass. What she's doing is making a particular shape and temperature. That way when we stick this on, again, it doesn't fuse to the bottom. And the light tap on the other side breaks nice and clean. So yeah, you guys got a treat to see this master glassmaker, Christina Logan, right up in person, right here. So I have had people ask me about, you know, my design process, and I think that just being a maker in the world, I'm always looking at, um, looking at life, looking at the places that I go, the places that I travel, the things that are in my hands, the things that other people make, and um, I'm constantly attracted to them. So whatever those, those forms are, somehow they get translated into the images that I want to make. Um, as far as the dot patterns in general, um, you know, it, it's just years of, you know, exploring, you know, how to how to put into a physical form the things that are in my head. So, you know, everybody has different things in their heads, and this is what, um, this is what I have in my head. <laughs> so I'm going to take this bead, and I'm happy with it. I like all the decoration, and I'm going to put it away and then this will be ready for a pickup um, when the team's ready. Yeah. Somebody asked about the um, the impact or the damage that um, this kind of work can have on my hands, or you know, somebody who's a flame worker. I, I do have to say that when I first started making beads, I was really into production. I made um, tiny little beads for $2.50, um, as many as I could, as fast as I could, for as many years as I could. <laughs> before having kids, I could work 12 hours a day at the torch. What it, it did do is it induced some arthritis in my left hand, in my thumb. So it wore away a little bit of the cartilage there. Um, I even had a little brace made for me. But what I realized is that 
Uh, my body really isn't um, destined to do that kind of production work. So how I got out of it is I ended up changing the way I worked. So instead, I invested a little bit more on sculptural work. I started doing a little bit more pot de verre, um, a little bit more metal work. I changed it up. So instead of sitting there and doing one thing all the time, um, I ended up moving around, like in the studio. I'll do something for four hours, something else for two hours, something else for one hour. When well, I told the doctor that um, you know, my left hand was so important to me because it was my lathe, he said, your body is not supposed to be a lathe. <laughs> We're seeing everything in moderation, right? Right, 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 right. Okay, I'm very happy with the speed. I'm going to put it away. Okay, so third time the charm over here on the finial. I think we've got it. Finial's <laughs> the, the top part. This is the actual lid. So we're going to clean this up a little bit more. And this tool Jeff's using is called a parachovies. They're graphite. Sometimes you can use wood ones, but they're rounded. So they're going to have a softer touch to the glass when they're round. And also, um, when you're making round things, that's a great tool to use. And when Dane comes and brings that punty, my job is just to keep this nice and warm so I can have some time outside of the kiln, I mean, outside of the flame, so it's not going to crack. So it's nice and warm. And just have a steady hand. Make that connection. There's plenty of heat coming off the, the punty pipe as well to keep that bead warm so we don't have to rush it. Snap it off, and then he'll warm it up in the furnace. You're welcome. Again, we'll do that inside punty. So Catherine will strip or pull some of that glass off the punty. Jeff will cut it. What that does is it cools it also, but then she rolls on the floor, getting a little bit of resist or dirt. As soon as we stick it on, we center the two. In a moment, we'll break it free from the other punty.
All right, so that nice little addition to the finial. And we'll get ready to put this into our annealing. So we had a question come on the line about uh, having uh, different COEs or different colors having the same COE in different working temperatures and processes. Um, certain glass that have the same COE can have different kind of uh, stiffness and softness due to the color composition. So certain colors can be really stiff. There's lots of metals in them. Certain colors can be really soft, like this cobalt blue. There's not really much in it besides cobalt oxide and the base soda lime. So certain colors can have different working properties. But all different glass has all different working properties. So borosilicate glass versus soda lime glass is going to work very different to the process that we're doing right now. Chit chat that we just had was trying to figure out what we were going to do next. So the bead that I was working on um, while they were doing the goblet with the three beads, so this big one I just took back out of the kiln. It has oranges and pinks and very small, minute turquoise blue dots, and we're going to make that into a goblet. And while they work on that, then I'm going to do another um, small bead that will be um, another finial for a different lid. We have, next time they open up the kiln, take a peek, you have a little moment to see all the work that we've been working on for the day. And you can kind of um, see all the other pieces that are in there. So we're going to get going on the next one. Dane again is preparing the punty. So Dane's getting ready. I'm going to have my tweezers ready. I know that this bead's nice and hot. It's not going to crack while I take the time to come over here outside of the flame. Squash it onto the, the punty rod. We'll give it a turn, make sure it's centered. We're way better at getting this centered. When I first started doing this first day, I wasn't very good at it, but now I'm better. <laughs> Snap it off, and off he goes. So while they work on that piece, I'll just quietly be working away here, making another finial. So maybe, Jeff, we can make this one with a cup that's taller. It's kind of a big one. Yep. Yeah. So always communicating when we're working in a team. It's always nice to have the whole team on board and on the right page. That's one thing I love about glass making is the team collaborative part of it. It's been great too. As you know, when I first came here, um, Jeff had made a couple goblets in a really deep Venetian style with lots of, um, you know, twisted cups and twisted feet and gold foil. Gold on there, yeah. That seems very as Jeff. As I like, like to say, backflips and you know, <laughs> twists and double luxes and um, is you know, his skill in doing cups is amazing. And it shows in the detail that we've got here, but I really asked for um, a very simple foot and a very simple cup to go with the um, decorated feet. I mean, the, the decorated stems that I'm working on.
So all the leftover pipes and punties that have a glass on them, uh, you might hear in you know a few minutes you hear cracking coming from over there. That's the glass cooling too quickly; it cracks off the iron, and that's due to thermal shock. So the metal and the glass are cooling at two different rates. So it's really self-cleaning. We don't have to scrape any of the pipes off when we're finished. So when it's clean, we pick it back up, preheat it, and it's ready to use. Now, Christina and, and Jeff are making this process look very easy. It's all the years and years and years and decades of experience. Somebody asked about my torch that I'm working on. I brought this from home. Uh, this is a Glass Torch Technologies torch, a GTT. This, <laughs> <laughs> this one is um, called a Lynx. I think it might be the first Lynx they ever made. And um, so the knobs that I have on here I have the red knob to my right is the fuel source. So when I'm home, I'm usually using propane. Here in um, the amphitheater hot shop, I'm using compressed um, natural gas, which whenever I get a chance, that's my preferred fuel source. But at home, it's propane. And then the two um, green and blue knobs are oxygen. So <coughs> the knob that is horizontal is a surface mix oxygen. And then the knob that is straight up and down face towards me is an internal mix oxygen. So oxygen, oxygen, and fuel. I like to say that I can make <coughs> beads on any torch. <laughs> so sometimes when people ask me, oh, you know, I need to get the torch that you have in order to make beads, it doesn't matter. Just give me a torch and a flame and some glass and we can just make stuff. And that's the nice thing, you get to travel the globe doing this, right? Work on any torch I anywhere, any, any part of the world. Any torch anywhere, yeah. Sometimes they're loud and messy, but you can still do it. I'm glad I don't have a loud torch, too. <laughs> One that pops. <laughs> so again, Jeff's opening up that foot. He's being really cautious not to overheat that little transition piece between the, the bead and the, the foot. If he overheats that and he opens the foot up as he does that, the whole thing moves. So it's really great skill of temperature control right here. So I'm using a marble mold, which is made out of graphite, in order to shape up this gather of glass. And the reason why is just because it's fast. You know, it's, it's a quick way to get a form that I can work with. If I didn't have the marble mold, I could do it and just use gravity. But, but this mold is uh, easy and quick. So 
and the foot and the stem part of the bead will go to the garage to stay warm. I've never made marbles before, but now I might start <laughs> making marbles. This is actually really fun. Oh, yeah, anything without a hole, I guess it's a marble, right? Round? Or a paperweight. <laughs> Baby paperweights for dollhouses. <laughs> All right, so now I've got the shape that I want. And I'm going to turn the flame down in order to get the detail. And the first row is the hardest. The first row is really where I need to concentrate and think about the amount of glass that's going down. And I have to concentrate more on the space between the dots than the actual dots themselves. So somebody asked about the difference between propane and natural gas. Um, I really can't speak too much about the temperature difference. For me, it's more the feeling. It's kind of like cooking, hmm, maybe cooking with electric oven versus cooking with a gas oven. So I really like um, the way that the glass melts with natural gas. I can find that since with my patterns and details, I love um, really subtle uh, lines and definition between colors. And I find that the definition is greater. Um, the detail is more beautiful when it's natural gas. Um, I do find that propane at home for me, if I get down to the bottom of my propane tank, I just use those little propane tanks, those 20 pound propane tanks. If I get down towards the bottom of that, it starts to mix with the, um, the smell that they put inside the tank, and that contamination actually changes the way the glass melts on the surface of the bead. So I'll fill the tank again. So I'm always working with, as much as I can, a full tank of gas. Sure. So. It's kind of like cooking with olive oil versus butter, right? Yes, yeah. yeah preference. Where you can still get there, but yeah. um, <laughs> there is a little bit of a preference. Yeah. So this time we're working on a little bit taller cup form. So Jeff and Catherine are working together on this. How are you guys doing today? Take care, yeah. If you guys are just, join, just joining us, this is Christina Logan. She's our guest artist. And uh, we are live on the Corning YouTube channel right now. So, And uh, later, a few weeks from now, this will actually be on Corning's YouTube channel permanently as well. So Christina Logan's a glass master, uh, decorating bead object maker. Her expertise is, expertise is these dot kind of designs. You say dot queen, right? Apparently, I have a nickname, the dot, dot queen. queen. <laughs> and really, that nickname came, I can't say because I do the best dots out there, but when I first started making beads back in 1990, there were not very many of us. This is before um, the internet had exploded and you could go on eBay and find things um, and have forums and communicate. Uh, so when the few contemporary glass bead makers got together, it was really easy to identify what everybody was doing. You know, there was a person who did flowers, there was a person who did marinis, and I was the person who did dots. So very quickly I got the nickname the dot queen and that sort of stuck through my whole career. So what we've been working on is Christina's been making these very, very complex, intricate forms, and then we're attaching them to a, a foot and a cup, making them a, a collaborative goblet or stemware. Just uh, last week when I was getting ready to come here, I, I needed to figure out, um, you know, when I was making these 
parts, how these parts would actually be put into a goblet, like what step in the goblet process. So I went on to the Corning website and I looked at the live stream um, videos that they had of goblet makers and I was sitting there working at the torch and I had my computer open up and I was watching live streams the of R &D, goblet right? makers while I was uh, making yeah. this in order to try to figure out, okay, do I have to attach it from the front? Do I have to attach it from the back? Which way do I need to attach it? And um, it's kind of a fun little uh, feeling to have done that and now I'm one of the live stream people. <laughs> <laughs> I found it very comforting to, yeah. to watch somebody work. All right, so we had a question come on online of where's a good uh, spot to, or a good place to find glass blowing tools. There's a few different sources out there for furnace glass working. We, we've got a few of Olympic color rods, carries a few um, tools. We've got Carlo Dona tools as well in Murano, Italy. And then we have whale apparatus, carries some tools as well. Christine, did you want to touch any of the lamp working tools as well? Everything that you just said can work for lamp working as well. If you go online, you can also search for, um, for lamp working, specifically bead making. Um, in the bead making world, there are people who are making you know, handmade tools. There's Franz Art Glass. There's um, Arrow Springs. Um, those two are out in the Pacific Northwest area, one in Seattle, one out in California. And, and Griff well, Griffin Tools, right? Griffin Tools yeah. here locally. Um, they're kind of easy to find. Okay, so one of the questions was, um, do I use a torch, um, a uh, graphite paddle, a graphite pad attached to my torch? So if, let me just see if the camera's on me. So that would be a little up here attached to my torch. I used to have that when I was working on a different kind of torch, when I was working on a minor bench burner. And then when I switched over to um, this Lynx about 18 years ago, I never mounted it on there. So I sort of abandoned that idea and now I just pick up the graphite paddle whenever I need it. In front of me, I have a six inch by six inch piece of graphite that's raised up on a brick. And um, I brought this from home. This is exactly how I work at home. So all my marvering and shaping happens on this surface in front of me instead of right here um, under my chin. So I, I have glass on it right now, but usually this surface right here is all clear, ready for me to then roll my work um, out, my little marver in front of me. So the question was whether or not I have an oxygen concentrator at home, and yes, I do. Uh, I have an oxygen concentrator that the output is supposed to be about 15 PSI. I think it's a little bit less than that. Um, I do run this torch, my links on it. If I were to have a choice between um, my oxygen concentrator and a tank of oxygen, I prefer the tanked oxygen. I like the consistency of it. I like the, um, the way that it melts the glass. But the oxygen concentrators are, are pretty nice to know that you don't have to worry about a bottle being uh, delivered to your doorstep. You can just turn it on right away.
So again, starting to add the volios in between the two sections. We've got that inside punty on the cup form. And Catherine's just bringing over those avolios again of a mixture. Moretti and soda lime. I have to say, the experience about working with here, about coming, you know, having done the experiment a year ago, having this idea, preparing to come, and then landing, and then not knowing, you know, really, this is a moment of experimentation. It's not really a moment of production. Though we've got a lot of work done, it wasn't like I was coming thinking, oh, I'm going to make these and then sell them. It was more, we're going to come here and try to figure out if this idea um, is viable, if it'll work. And it has been so exciting <laughs> because um, even from day one, the possibility of um, this really working out has been evident. And this is kind of just a leaping point for this it technique. It is totally a leaping point. Um, so I'm really charged up you know, to take these ideas home, sit with them, think about them, um, really study the pieces that have been made over the past three days and um, think about what the next step would be. So just f finalizing that foot there, and then Dane standing by with her loading fork to put this into our annealing oven. Beautiful colors on that one. Love that question. I just got a question. What did you want to be when you grew up as a kid? I love this. Well, because I have kids, right? So you know, four little kids get qu that question all the time. So um, growing up, I was raised by a single mom. And she um, rolls her eyes every time I say it in an uninsulated A-frame in the north of New Hampshire. Um, we did have some insulation, but it was cold. Uh, and she is an artist, okay? So she raised us, my brother and I, um, being a graphic illustrator. So her whole message to me as a little kid was always do what you love and somehow you'll figure out the money. Like don't make the money first. Make what you love doing the priority. So we always heard that growing up. Uh, I knew I could draw. I kind of was given a hand just because of DNA, I think. My daughter also, at age 15, has the same thing. Um, my son also is really good with fine motor skills, so there was something in the family um, that way, and I always knew I could draw. So I went to the University of New Hampshire, and I thought I was going into the drawing program, which I did. I ended up loving sculpture even more, studying sculpture, and didn't know anything about glass. When I got out of school, I worked in a cafe and I had a little studio and I carved sculptures with, you know, chainsaws and wood and um, somebody came into the cafe who worked for glass artist Dan Daly. So I ended up just by chance working in Dan Daly's studio for four years and that's where um, I got to see glass and I 
never thought it was going to be any material that I would work with in my own work. I was still kind of afraid of color and just wanted to draw. Um, but after the four years, I saw somebody one night flame working. And what intrigued me was that the flame was something that I could do all by myself. And it had this kind of precious quality of adornment and the human figure and gems. And I started making beads. And so that was in 1990. And little by little, it became something that I could make a little bit of money on. And um, it really didn't begin as something that was very serious, but it did offer me uh, freedom. And I could make a little bit of a living right away. And um, then I ended up studying beads and learning about the culture and learning about the history and how it um, connects to humans all over the world. And uh, my goal was always to make things with my hands for a living. So little did I know it would be um, glass beads. But I think that I kind of did know as a young person that I wanted to make things with my hands. So. So that's what I tell my kids. Awesome. Do what you love. Figure it out after. This one over here, the bench will be another lid. So again, Catherine brings the punty. Jeff adheres the punty and centers the two. And then it's a light tap on the jack line right there. It breaks nice and clean. So the reheating chambers here in the shop is what we turn off at the e end of the evening, but the furnace never turns off. It stays on 24 hours a day. So Christina just transferred her bead there. <laughs> that was a nice transfer. Did you see that? That was a transfer uh, via the table. Via the I table. Just, via the table. I dropped that. I was looking around for the ivory glass. I thought that I had it in the kiln, and next thing you know, the thing just dropped onto the floor, um, onto the table. So it picked up a little bit of um, grunge, but that's okay because <laughs> I am going to put an ivory over that and it's going to trap it. You won't be able to see it. It's kind of a lesson in keeping the surface of your uh, table clean. And not panicking when things drop. Yeah. <laughs> right, you can pick them up again. I think that goes for every glass maker. Don't exactly. panic when things fall. Yeah. What do they want to know? So again, cooling the top portion there, cracking that free, and taking some thicker material away.
So again, this will be our lid. And Christina's working on the finial part right there. It'll be attached to the top of the lid. So you can see the angle of Jeff's holding those jacks it creates that exterior fold and starts to kind of corks it into the way it wants to go. It really comes down to all glass makers really is how you hold the tool and which angle you use the tool at. This glass is very thin, so it cools very quickly when we're on these punties. So we always have to reheat it very frequently. Our cadence between the bench and the reheating chamber picks up pretty frequently with thin glass. There he goes, pushing that further. And we got this beautiful, nice fold. And this propane torch, the fluffy torch, can keep that punty in the back of the form nice and warm. At the word, I just received word that they are ready for my part. Uh, so what I'm going to do right now is, um, fortunately, I'm almost done. I'm just going to put a couple little detailed turquoise dots on here, and then I'll hand it off. So we had a question come on in line of how we mix the, the mixture that we're using, the, this Moretti and soda lime glass. <laughs> so what we did is we took some uh, Moretti pre-made glass that uh, Christina was, is using and chopped those up into small pieces. And then we also did the same thing with our cobalt blue soda lime glass, chopped them up in small pieces and then added them to this mini melter and just turned it on and started to melt it. It's kind of like making soup, right? Just like making wild rice yeah. soup. So right now Jeff's just kind of uh, keeping things warm until we're all ready to attach our inside punty and then eventually the finial to the top. Okay, so I have all the dots down. <clears throat> My last little moment is going to uh, melt them in so that they are uh, completely smooth on the surface. I'm gonna give it a really light touch with the graphite paddle. I'm 
I'm going to make a joke that I make the squinty face every time I marver. I'm going to make that squinty face. Okay, so I'll let Dane know that I'm ready. There's the secret head nod. So, Dane will start so just having the tools ready <clears throat> is kind of nice. So I make sure that I have my the snips available. Make sure I have my tweezers in hand. I'm going to keep this warm, and then we'll be ready to go. So Dane will prepare the punty. <clears throat> And I'll bring it over to Christina, and we'll stick that right on to the punty. Clip the other end. And then any little bit that um, I don't really worry about how close I break those off because I know that the next bit, they can just pull that any extra once it's melted. So Catherine's standing by for the signal to start the inside punty in just a moment. So let's go ahead. So Catherine will start the inside punty again. So bring that little bit of glass over the marver, kind of pull and strip some of that glass off the punty. Jeff will cut it, and then Catherine will roll a little bit on the floor. A little bit of a touch to the floor. Right here to the, the middle. As soon as it's on center, a light tap. So we'll stick that back on and kind of just reset. That's what we want to happen, but at the last step. So again, just reset, reassemble, and so go again and again. Good move there by the team to reheat that punty and stick it right back on. Jeff was literally ca caught that lid in the shears. <laughs> so using that torch, keeping things warm. Again, same thing. Pull the glass off the punty, snip it, roll it on the floor, and stick it right into the middle. Again, rolling on the floor is to create that little bit of resist or dirt, so it comes off really easily later. There we are. So they're going to tra transfer those back and forth. Keeping things warm, Catherine will bring over that 50-50 mix of Moretti and soda lime. Spooling it around itself, making that avolio. We'll do that one more time. So here we go with the attachment. So 
always turning. And all cool with some shears and a light tap. There we are. And one last detail will add that little bit of a, of a top to that. There we are, that last little bit. And just homogenizing everything in temperature. And also allowing that little bit of uh, last piece of glass to round off just a little bit. Okay, Dane will catch it in the fork, light tap, breaks free, and away it goes to our annealing oven for the rest of the evening. You can see the rest of the things we made earlier today there. Let's give it up. One big round of applause for the entire team. Christina Logan, Jeff Mack, Dane Jack, Catherine Ayers, myself, Josh. Thank you.